Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. A quick word before we get into this episode. As you guys know, this book, The Woman with the Alabaster Jar, has been a very tough book for me to get through. And a lot of it is because a lot of the information in this book is just not correct. And I've been very curious as to why God, why it's source, why Magdalene wanted us to look at this book, even though some of this information is not correct. So I've been asking that as of late. And the answer I got was because in our community, in the seeker community, the truther community, whatever you want to call this community, we have to understand where we have also been brainwashed. There is a lot of mind control that has happened in our community as well. In our French community, we know 90% of the people involved in this community are infiltrators. And their job is to put out junk conspiracy. Now, I'm not saying that Margaret Starbird, the writer of this book, is that. But I do, I am aware now that when she wrote this book, she was basing her findings off of junk conspiracy. And if we are to practice discernment in our search for the truth, this is something we have to be aware of. So that is why I believe in this moment, Magdalene and Source wanted us to go through this book so that we learn that discernment, so that we don't take everybody's word for it. We learn how to think for ourselves. So with that being said, on with the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce, and this is our continued look at um, The Woman with the Alabaster Jar by Margaret Starbird. Uh, if you're new here, this might be kind of shocking information. And of course, if you're not new here, you know that this um, book has been very hard for us to get through because there's a lot of misinformation or what, what do they say fake news in this book um, i don't blame margaret starbird for for this though i want to make that very clear this is an older book and if this if i had read this book about five years ago i probably would agree with everything margaret starbird is saying and i think that if margaret starbird were to research this today she would probably have very different findings because more and more and more information is available to us as to who magdalene was who yashua was all that kind of stuff so this is part four we're going to be looking at chapter three the blood royal and the vine if you miss the other parts to this uh they will be down in the description box below and again this is all going to be found in the playlist called understanding the magdalene so let's go ahead and get started the blood royal and the vine the fourth gospel says very cl clearly that the woman who anointed yashua at, Beth at bethany was mary the sister of lazarus oh god we're getting into this again i thought we left this behind She's going to continue to claim that Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene are the same people, and they're not. First of all, their names weren't Mary. <laughs> and again, we know they're not the same people if we read the missing books of the Bible. Mary of Bethany was Philip's wife, and that's in the Acts of Philip. And Mary Magdalene, or just Magdalene, was her real name, it's just Magdalene, was Yahshua's wife. But let's let's... <laughs> 
So right there in the first sentence, we're not we're not starting off on a, on a good note here. All right. And also, I want to say the fourth gospel. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, so the book of John. Y'all, the Bible should not be taken seriously as like factual information. All right. Um, as you guys know, once a week, I do a show on the Telegram channel. Enough is enough. That's run by Gordon Harkless. And uh, he said many times the Bible you have has been edited like 55 times. Also, the Bible that you have now is a variation of the King James Bible. And King James was an open Satanist. So it's not reliable information. I would never take anything written in the Bible as fact. It's not the word of God. I, I hate to break it to you, but and if that triggers you, then you need to do some self-reflecting because it's not the word of the real God. All right? And so... <laughs> My Bible I use is just a reference point to see where they change the story, just to see what the lies are. But if you look at the missing books of the Bible, you'll start to see the truth, the real truth. The missing books that we have available, most of the missing books that of the Bible are not available to us. They're under the Vatican. Talk about censorship. So anyway, let's let's reread that again. Wow, we are we are in for a doozy today, aren't we? The fourth gospel says very clearly that the woman who anointed Yahshua at Bethany was Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Mary Magdalene's name is not mentioned in connection with the anointing scene, but it is he, she who accompanies Yahshua to Calvary in the gospel standing near the cross. It is she who goes at dawn on Easter morning to finish the anointing for burial that she began several days before. We have examined the tradition of the Western church that Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene were one and the same. And no, they weren't. But why was Mary of Bethany called the Magdalene? Because she wasn't. Why was she forced to free Jerusalem? And what became of the sacred bloodline she carried with her? So again, Yahshua was never crucified. We've talked about this. It's kind of comical. I'll put this down in the description box below as well the celebration of lent and easter is what they were reenacting which is the story of tammuz and ishtar which is the descent of the human consciousness down to earth going through amnesia to then ascend into the higher realms of, of heaven and the priest and priesthood of isis which is what yeshua and magdalene were a part of they were not jewish they were egyptian they would reenact this every year. And so Magdalene was going to the tomb to basically get, yeah, he wasn't dead. He never was dead. There was a reenactment happening. You really think that the true God, the true source creator would require a blood sacrifice? I mean, I know common sense isn't so common, but let's like just kind of step away from the programming for a minute. What God requires a blood sacrifice? Lucifer. Not the real God. The secret marriage. I'm just going to tell you right now, their marriage was not a secret. There was no secret that they were married. I have come to suspect that Jesus, or Yahshua, had a secret dynastic marriage with Mary of Bethany. <laughs> nope. And that she was the daughter of the tribe of Benjamin, whose ancestral heritage was the land surrounding the holy city of David, the city of Jerusalem. No, because they weren't Jewish. And Mary Bethany is not Magdalene. And Yeshua, Jesus, being tell Satan, Yeshua was his name. There was not a, they, they, they didn't get married in secret. If you read the missing books of the Bible, their marriage was very, they were married. People knew that. No one had a problem with it. It's only us in our current times that actually have a seem to have a problem with them being married. Anyway, let's continue. The dynastic marriage between Yeshua and the royal daughter of the Benjamites would have been perceived as a source of healing for the people of Israel during the time of their misery in, in the occupied nation. But neither of them were from these Jewish houses. 
yes, there was a Jewish prophecy, but it wasn't that they were going to be Jewish. They were Egyptian. They had Jewish students. They had students from all walks of life, but they themselves were the Essenes. They were part of the priesthood and priestesshood of Isis and Osiris. Back in those days, you spelled Isis, E-S-S-E, -S -S -E, as in the Essenes. And the original prophecy said that there would be two teachers, not one teacher that would come two times, but two teachers, a feminine and a masculine, Magdalene, Yeshua. Israel first anointed King Saul. Israel's first anointed King Saul was the tribe of Benjamin and his daughter, Nicole, was the wife of King David. King David was a Satanist. Throughout the history of the tribes of Israel, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin were the closest and most loyal of allies. Their destinies were intertwined. A dynastic marriage between a Benjamite heiress to the lands surrounding the holy city and the Masonic son of David would have appealed to the fundamentalist zealot fractions of the Jewish nation. It would have been seen as a sign of hope and blessing during Israel's darkest hour. In the novel King Jesus, 1946, Robert Graves, the 20th century mythographer, suggests that Jesus' lineage and marriage were concealed from all but a select circle of royalist leaders. No. To protect the royal bloodline, this marriage would have been kept secret from the Romans and the Herodian tetrarchs. And after the crucifixion, which didn't happen, of Jesus, the protection of his wife and family would have been a sacred trust for those who knew their identity. All references to the marriage of Jesus would have been deliberately obscured, edited, or eradicated. Yet the pregnant knight, wife of the anointed son of David would have been the bearer of the hope of Israel, the bearer of the sangria, all the royal bloodline. No, 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 no. Once again, if you read the missing books of the Bible, their marriage was very open. It's only in the edited Bible where they changed their names that they've left out the marriage. So no. And the royal bloodline wasn't Yahshua. It was Magdalene. She was the Atlantean. That's where we're missing this here. All right. Magdal Eder, the Tower of the Flock. In chapter four of the Hebrew prophet Micaiah, we read a beautiful prophecy of the restoration of Jerusalem. When all nations shall beat their swords into plowshares and reconcile unto God. Beginning with verse eight, we find, as for you, O Magda Elder, watchtower of the flock, O stronghold of the daughter of Zion, the form of dominion will be, stored, will be restored to you. Kingship will come from the daughter of Jerusalem. Why do you now cry aloud? Have you no king? Has your counselor perished? The pain that seizes you like that of a woman in labor? Write in agony, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor, for now you must leave the city and camp in the open field. <laughs> I've been watching, uh, you know, I, I love studying cults, and there is a great series called Prisoner of the Prophet on Amazon Prime, and it's about a woman who escaped the FLDS. So every time I hear Zion and even reading that just kind of reminded me of the FLDS. Anyway, it's a great, great series if you haven't seen it. It is probable that the original references to Mary Magdalene in the oral tradition that pre-scopes of the New Testament were misunderstood before they were even committed to writing. I suspect that the Epheth Magdalene was meant to be an, an allusion to the Magdelder found in Micaiah, the promise of the restoration of Zion following her exile. Perhaps the earliest ver verbal references attaching the Epit Magdala to Mary of Bethany's name had nothing to do with the obscure town in Galilee, as is suggested, but were deliberate references to these lines in Micaiah to the watchtower or stronghold of the daughter of Zion, who was forced into political exile. And I think her main problem here, you guys, I think I just figured it out. I think this is Margaret Starbird's main problem. She's using the Bible. And the Bible's bullshit 
it's it's the bloodline of the controllers anyway the place named magda elder literally means tower of the flock in the sense of a high place used by a shepherd as a vantage point from which to watch over his sheep in Hebrew, the epheth Magdala literally means tower or elevated great magnificent. This meaning has particular relevance if the Mary so named was in fact the wife of the Messiah. Again, Messiah means a phallical pillar, not a savior. It would have been the Hebrew equivalent of calling her Mary the Great, while at the same time referring to the prophesied return of the dominion of the daughter of Jerusalem from Micaiah 4.8. Again, we don't need to be using the Bible as fact. And um, I want to reference the Galilee, the town in Galilee, That's a, that she is correct about that. Mary was it, or Ma her name was Magdalene. We call her Mary Magdalene because they say she's Miriam from Magdala. No, she was not from Magdala. She was from Egypt. And Magdala didn't even exist at the time she existed. And Magdalene was her name. That was actually her name. Like if she had a birth certificate back then, it would have been on her birth certificate. It was also her mother's name. So in the old French legend, the exiled Magda Eller, the refuge, Mary, who seeks asylum on the southern coast of France, is Mary of Bethany, the Magdalene. Nope. Again, two different people. Mary of Bethany was with Philip. That was his wife. And the south of France is actually Canada. So, the early French legend records that Mary Magdalene, traveling with Martha and Lazarus of Bethany, landed in a boat off the coast of Provence in France. Other legends credit Joseph of Arimathea as being the custodian of the San Graal, which I have suggested may be the royal bloodline of Israel rather than a literal chalice. It is the royal bloodline, but not of Israel, of Atlantis. Remember, the controllers invert everything. The vessel that contained this bloodline, the archetypal chalice of medieval myth, must have been the wife of the anointed King Jesus. Margaret Starbird, it's about Magdalene's bloodline. That's why they were called the Merovingians. That's why her descendants were called the Merovingians. They weren't called the Yeshavingians. They were called the Merovingians because it was about Magdalene. It was about Magdalene. She was the main character. The image of Jesus that emerges in our story is that of the charismatic leader who embodies the roles of prophet, healer, and Messiah king. Messiah means a phallical pillar or a penis. A leader who was executed by the Roman army of occupation whose wife and bloodline was secretly taken from Israel by his loyal friends and transplanted in Western Europe to await the fullness of time and culmination of prophecy. No, 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 no totally wrong i feel bad i mean the girl worked really hard on this book but this book is basically i mean we're gonna finish it because i don't censor on this channel but this book is just very much um in line with what the cabal wants us to think all right let's see here the friends of Jesus who believe so fervently that he was the Messiah, the anointed of God. No, Messiah means a phallical pillar or penis, not the anointed of God. Would have perceived the preservation of his family as a sacred duty, the vessel, the chalice that embodied the promises of the millennium, the San Graal of medieval legend was, as I have come to believe, Mary Magdalene. Margaret, her name was Mary, girl. Mary was a very, very very <laughs> bad name. We need to have a little bit more respect. Her name was Magdalene. The vine of the Lord. Many biblical passages use the word vine as a metaphor for the chosen people of God. God doesn't have chosen people. All of us are chosen by God. That That's a red flag. Like when you see that in a religion where God's chosen people, huge red flag. Huge, huge red flag. 
a vine thou didst bring out of Egypt, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts in the house of Israel and the men of Ju Judah are his cherished plant. Several passages refer to the vine as feminine. Thy wife is like a fruitful vine. Your mother is like a vine planted by the water, fruitful and branchy, but she was torn up and now she is planted in the desert. She is now without a royal branch, a royal scepter. This transplanted royal vine is understood by biblical scholarship to refer to the royal divinic line of Judah, the line of princes. That's the line of the controllers. David, King David was a Satanist, you guys. This is, this is actually in the Bible and in the missing books of the Bible. David gave his kingdom to Solomon. Why? Because Solomon was the only one of his sons who was continuing with the religious practice of offering virginal burnt burnt offerings to God. What God? The God they left their virginal burnt offerings to, which virginal as a child, burnt offerings, need I say more, was the God called Yahweh. Yahweh is Moloch. The line of David are the controllers. They're not the good guys. Once you see it, you cannot unsee it. The bride in the canticles carefully tends to the vine. In Isaiah 5, the rebellious vineyard brings forth wild grapes. Psalms 10 is a prayer for the restoration of the vine vineyard. Take care of this vine and protect what your right hand has planted. In Mark's gospel, Jesus tells the parable of the vine dresser, caretaker of the vineyard, Israel, who beat the servants of their master when they came to inspect the condition of the vines and then killed the master's son. No one who knew Jesus of Nazareth or who had ears to hear was in any doubt to identify that faithful son. He was the legitimate heir to the vineyard of Judah. But Yahshua was not from Nazareth. He was from Egypt. Do you guys not see how the controllers have duped us into worshiping them? The transplanting of the divinic vine would have come as no surprise to the zealot fundamentalist friends of Yahshua or Jesus. They knew it had been prophesied. It had happened before when the people of Israel were taken as slaves to Babylon. But it could also happen again. In light of the danger of the vine of Judah, the royal bloodline, it was likely that the friends of Yahshua, Jesus, took strong and perhaps desperate measures to protect the family of Jesus. It would have been their top priority. But Jesus, Yeshua, wasn't crucified. He lived a long, full life with Magdalene and their children. The flight into Egypt. Under the conditions of the Roman occupation of Israel, which we don't even know if the Roman Empire actually existed or not. Like We don't even know if the Roman Empire actually existed. A lot of the Roman remains we see are remains of Tartaria. So let me read that again. Under the conditions of the Roman occupation of Israel, the Holy Family would have been kept secret and protected at all costs by the royalist factions in Palestine. It seems obvious that after the crucifixion of Jesus, Mary Magdalene was no longer in Jerusalem. Because Yahshua wasn't crucified. That's a made-up story. The real God doesn't require blood sacrifice. There is no mention of Mary, Martha, Martha, or Lazarus in the book of Acts or in Paul's letters. Once again, Margaret Starber, that's where I'm going to have to really give you some shit, girl. Why are you using the Bible as your reference point? It's made up. There, That's fact. That's like using a book of Grimm's fairy tales to prove your point. Like, it's made up. In any case, it is unlikely that Mary would ever have been identified as the widow of Jesus. Well, her name was Magdalene. The word Jesus means hell Satan. And she was married to Yahshua. And they would have absolutely known she was his wife. The danger would have been too great. No, they knew. It seems more likely that these special friends of Jesus were no longer part of the community in Jerusalem at the time of Paul's letters were written, but their departure is unexplained. If they had been part of that community following the ascension of Jesus, their names might have been mentioned in the later New Testament works that were declared canonical. No, if, if they were for any good, nothing in the Bible is good, Margaret Starbird. 
Constantine was a Satanist. It all the Council of Nicaea. They were a Satanist. They were a Satanist, girl. They were Satanist. This is fact. There is so much evidence. And for King James, there's like literal documented proof. Like that he was a Satanist, honey. Like this is not, this should not be taken seriously. Instead, post-ascension references to Mary Magdalene only occur in the Gnostic Gospels, of which ancient Coptic scrolls were found in Nag Hammadi, 1945, and other sites of Egypt. Yes, texts that confirm that Mary Magdalene was an intimate companion of Jesus. Yes, because their marriage was not secret. That's what I'm saying, Margaret. You think that the Bible is like the true truth. And oh, look, these are just extras. No, the extras, the hidden gospels, that's the truth. The Bible is the propaganda. The Bible is the control tactic. It's the fake news. The Gospel of Philip says there were three who walked the Lord at all times. His mother, his sister, and Magdalene, who was called his companion. Magdalene is described in the Gnostic Gospels found at Mag Hammadi as having aroused the jealousy of the apostles because she was the close companion or consort of the Lord, who often kissed her on the mouth. And Yahshua never called himself God. He never called himself the Lord. Not in the missing books of the Bible. That is something that Constantine added to the scripture at the Council of Nicaea because Satanists worship humans. So they wanted to trick you into worshiping a human. It is clear from the four canonical gospels that Magdalene enjoyed special precedence in the community of believers since she was the first person, person to speak, see and speak to Yahshua on Easter Sunday, having hurried to his tomb at first light to perform embalming rites of his dead body. No, girl, no, he wasn't dead. She knew he wasn't dead. It was a reenactment. She was going to, coming to get him. Time to go home. We got some kids we got to take care of. There were seven lists in the four gospel that named the woman who accompanied, accompanied Yahshua. In six of the seven, the name of Magdalene was given first, ahead of Mary, the mother of Jesus, whose name was actually Alma Mari, and the other women mentioned. The gospel writers, beginning with Mark, are most likely reflecting the status of Magdalene in the Chris Christian community, that of the first lady. No, because they were teachers. They were not trying to be cult leaders. They were teachers. And... Margaret, there were way more than seven women with Yahshua and Magdalene who were their students. There were like 70 disciples. Most of them were women. So you got to get rid of this idea that the Bible is telling you the truth. If you believe the Bible is telling you the truth, that's like being in an abusive relationship, believing your husband's going to change. It's just not. It's, it's, you got to get out of your cognitive dissonance. All right. The Coptic scrolls were hidden at Nag Hammadi in about AD 400 during a period in which the Orthodox Christian Church, having been declared the official church of the Roman Empire by the Emperor Theodosius, began persecuting and destroying the documents of sects it deemed heretical. These scrolls were preserved in jars similar to those containing the scrolls of the Dead Sea caves near Qumran in the Judea Desert. Found in the 1940s and 50s, they have opened up a whole new era of research into the early centuries of Christianity. The prominence of Magdalene in the four canonical Gospels is strengthened in many of these apocryphal documents. The Coptic scrolls, many of which are 2nd and 3rd century parchments, predate the existing copies of the canonical Gospels by centuries. And miraculously, they survived the, church, the purge by the early church, just as the Dead Sea Scrolls of Qumran community survived destruction by the Roman legions during the Jewish revolt 66 to 74 AD when the nation of Israel was virtually destroyed and the Christian communities of Jerusalem was wiped out. Who knows if that's actually how it happened because our history has been made up too. Jesus and the zealot faction. We have touched on the politics of the Jewish zealots at the time of Jesus. Now it's time to address briefly the nature of the cha charges brought against Jesus that caused Pilate, the Roman procurer of the province, to order him to be crucified. This is going to be so hard to get through, guys, because it's just not true. I feel like I'm back in church. The order that thrust his wife Mary into the gravest danger. For if Jesus was charged only with the blasphemy of claiming to be the son of God, as the Bible suggests, 
his life would have been in little danger, but he was crucified for sedition and for his political affiliations. And I intend to show she would certainly have been forced to flee for her wife. But that didn't happen, Margaret. That did not happen. Yeah, I would, is Margaret Starbird still alive? Like, I kind of want to talk to her and be like, all right, girl. We know this book was written because you were heavily brainwashed by the church. Obviously, you were heavily brainwashed by the cabal. But now if we present you with more evidence, how do you perceive this information? There is massive evidence to support the theory that Jesus was sympathetic with the right-wing activists of Israel. For one thing, several of his apostles are known to have been militant extremists. Judas Iscariot being a man most often cited. The word Iscariot attached to his name is widely understood to indicate that he belonged to the aforementioned radical brotherhood of political assassins. The Ciceri are sons of the dagger. <sighs> Another follower of Jesus, Simon the Canaan, is mentioned in Matthew 10, 4. The footnote in my Bible says the Canaan is the root word for zealot. Remembering that the gospel stories were spread by word of mouth for several decades before they were first committed to parchment, it is possible that the marriage of Cana was in fact the marriage of the zealots. The consonants of the two words are similar enough to cause confusion in oral tradition. Perhaps his marriage of Cana was one of national importance to the Jews, namely that of Jesus to Mary Magdalene. The changing of the water into wine could have been understood as a symbolic imparting of new life, a renewed Masonic hope and joy into the stone water jars of Judaism. I laugh because if you've been following along with this for a while, you know that in the Magdalene manuscript, the, the wedding where the water is turned into wine is an actual wedding and it's Magdalene and Yahshua's wedding. Stories about the life and teachings of Jesus circulated for more than 30 years before our earliest versions. The Gospel of Mark was written in about 70 AD. No, honey, it was written by King James. <laughs> Girl, it was written by King James. Not written. This is not, no, it was written by King James. Come on, come on. A little common sense here. I guess common sense ain't so common, but just a little common sense here. The linguistic study of folk etymology confirms the details of the story are unintentionally modified as they are passed along by word of mouth. Sometimes idioms, colloquies, and proper names are misinterpreted or misspelled. If Simon the Canaan was Simon the Zealot, about which there seems no doubt, then Canna would easily be the reference to the zealot party as well. But again, you're basing all of your information on false information. So none of this, none of this would fly in a court of law, right? None of it. In the opinion of many New Testament scholars and the charge brought against Jesus, the charge that put his wife in so much danger that she fled to flee Jerusalem was not blasphemy, but sedition. The arguments for understanding Jesus as a political figure, the Jewish de divinic Messiah, the Jewish divinic penis, who posed an accurate threat to the stability of the Roman province of Palestine, are carefully outlined in SGF Brandon in the book Jesus and the Zealots. Oh, these these scholars are going to really have a hard time when the truth comes out. You think that the, that the uh, what are they called? Virtue signaling warriors are good, are having a hard time. Just wait until these scholars learn that their degrees are based on lies. The spontaneous popular movement that surged in response to Jesus and his ministry was a direct challenge to the political authority of Rome. He was accused of inciting the people to riot. The traditional Roman punishment reserved for zealot insurrections was crucifixion. In fact, during the period from 86 until the fall of Jerusalem in 8070, hundreds of Jewish patriots were crucified. The crowds followed Jesus from town to town during his ministry, and once or twice the gospel reports that they wished to make him king. But the action that led to his immediate arrest by the authorities in Jerusalem was the overturning of the tables of money chargers in the temple of Jerusalem during the Passover festival. Oh my God, Margaret. Oh my God, girl. Like, I can't. Here I was at the beginning of this video, like, trying to excuse you. 
But literally, it when Yahshua turned over the tables in the temple, it had nothing to do with money. That was changed in the Bible. They were doing sacrifices. Girl, girl, read the missing books of the Bible. There is more truth in those books than in your King James Bible that's been edited 55 times. I'm just going to be real honest here. Putting that in there about the, the business makes you look real stupid. It makes you look like you are a puppet for the controllers. Every year, Jews from all over the empire flock to Jerusalem to make their offerings in the temple. Sacrificial offerings, not money. The actions that Jesus allegedly took, scattering coins of empire all over the temple floor, was a radical attack on the religious establishment of the temple priests and Sadducees. The ruling elite who collaborated with the Roman authorities to preserve peace and order in the province. <sighs> the desert community that authored many of the Dead Sea Scrolls has long characterized the temple cult and its priests as wicked and false to the teachings of the Torah and the prophets because they were. They had said the temple itself was unclean. It worshiped def its worship defiled by associations with pagans. No, not with. Pagans were a word that was invented by the controllers. That word did not exist when the Essenes wrote all the books found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And again, the Essenes were the priests and priesthood of Isis. That word pagan did not exist. They were defiled because they were doing sacrifices, Margaret. Animal and human. That's why the temples were defiled. Not because of pagan things. Links between the early Christian movement, the Qumran community, and Masada, the last stronghold of the Zealots, against the Roman legions are all well documented. No, honey. No, honey. Documented by the controllers. It's called propaganda. Fake news. The community at Qumran, reflected in the Dead Sea Scrolls, was radically anti-Roman, anti-establishment, apocalyptic, and messianic, except for the restoration of the divinic line to the throne of Israel. Nope. The war scroll, which I've read on this channel before, found in one of the jars in the Davidic Messiah is called the Scepter. They denounced the elite class of Sadducees who controlled the corrupted worship in the temple and exploited the poor with their demands for sacrifices and thighs. Okay, yes, there you go. Sacrifices. That's why they did not like the temple. Sacrifices. The Qurams sectarians believe themselves to be the pure remnants of Israel. No, honey, they were Egyptian. They were the pure remnants of Atlantis. Come on, girl. Come on. Its members practice rites similar to later baptism of the early Christian community. Nope. And they mark their foreheads of their initiatives with the sign given in Ezekiel 9 for making them truly enlightenment. Those who grieved over the abomination practices in Jerusalem. She's saying later Christians' use of the X was believed to be the first initial of the Greek word Christos, but the actual practice of marking initiated elect was the same. It's kind of like the, um, I was thinking more of the bindi that's used in, in Hinduism to mark prayer and puja. The community of Qumran held itself aloof from those who collaborated with Romans. Many of their beliefs and doctrines hid in the jars for nearly 2,000 years, not that long, echoed the radical dualism and apocalypticism of the New Testament writings. Copies of some of the same manuscripts were also found at the fortress of Masada, the zealot stronghold that fell to the Romans in AD 73 after the mass suicide of its defenders. Only the last several decades since their discovery in 1947 have biblical scholars had access to this invaluable information on the roots of the Christian movement. The partisans at Qumran would undoubtedly have applauded Jesus' radical overturning of the money tables in the temple during the Passover feast. It wasn't money tables. Again, it was sacrifices, honey. Read the missing books of the Bible. Read them. Don't just talk about them, but read them. It's all there. If I could read them, you could read them. I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm just a person who had some questions. And so I went to look for answers and I surely found them. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Nope. 
Based on the texts found in the canonical Greek scriptures of the New Testament, there is good reason to believe that many Jewish is that Jews accepted Jesus as the promised Messiah of the line of David. No, 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 no. Messiah, again, means a phallical pillar, which means penis. That is used specifically for a marriage. The woman is the Visica Pisces. We've talked about this. Jesus is not your Messiah. He's Magdalene's. Jesus is not your penis. He's Magdalene's. He's not your husband. You got your own Messiah. I got my own Messiah. And we're not looking for the line of David. We don't want the line of David. Y'all, we, we don't want. We don't want Satanists. We don't. Really, we don't. The earliest written as attainment to the fact that Jesus was believed by the Christian community to be the divinic Messiah is found in Paul's epistle to the Romans 1-3, thought to have been written around AD 57. It's saying of Jesus, who as his human nature was the descendant of David. Okay, but we know Paul's letters were like literally made up by the Roman church. It's like we know that. The guy I do shows with on Enough is Enough, Michael, he can tell you all about that. Like, literally, this is made up shit. The Gospel of Mark records the triumphal entry of Jesus in Jer Jerusalem when the people spread palm before the king riding on a donkey. The palm tree is a symbol for the Jewish nation and is found on coins minted in the Roman times. The fact that Jesus was believed to be the king of the Jews is also affirmed by the inscription that Pilate ordered posted above the cross on which the Roman soldiers crucified him. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews... Anyone you want crucified? That's made up. Mithra was crucified. Jesus was not. Yeshua was not. His name was Yeshua, not Jesus. The J sound did not exist back then. Galilee, the reputed homeland of Jesus, is now acknowledged to have been the hotbed of zealot, zealot and anti-Roman activity during the first century AD, which may be relevant to the ultimate ch charge of sedition. There was no charge of sedition, Ma Margaret. Didn't happen, honey. That's a That's a fairy tale. That's a story of propaganda to put you in a fear state so that you submit to the church, which is run by Satanists. There is ample evidence that Jesus was not just a poor carpenter or the son of a carpenter on an obscure town in Galilee. That is true. Okay, so that's true what she put there. Yeah, the the what they use for carpenter actually is architect. So Yeshua was born to a pretty wealthy family, a pretty powerful and wealthy family, as was Magdalene. So people knew who they were. Right. They were born into the elite. Yeah. The evangelist Matthew and Luke, who were both writing at approximately the same time between the year 80, 80 and 85, but who were unaware of one another's work, include genealogies of Jesus at the beginning of their Gospels. No, honey, because those Gospels were made up. The reason why they're the same is because they were made up by King James, who was part of the divinic line and wanted people to worship the cabal. Although these genealogies are a variance with one another, one thing can be inferred. The claim was being made that Jesus was the expected divonic Messiah. No. The testimony of both these Gospels and that Roman go governor and the Jewish leaders collaborated in the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus because he was perceived by both Jewish and Roman authorities to be a dangerous insurrectionist. His death was believed by these authorities to be a political necessity in order to avoid further rebellion in Palestine. He was considered an incendiary because the people believed he was their promised Messiah and King, the anointed one of God, the just ruler proclaimed by their prophets. From the Gospels... We surmise that Jesus was the people's choice because his miracles proved to them that he was Yahweh's choice. Yahweh is Moloch. Yahweh is Moloch. Boom, 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 boom. There you go, Margaret Starbird. You just proved me right and you wrong. Honey, this is all made up by Satanists. This is all made up by some Satanists. Girl. Girl, you're gullible, girl. I know you're smarter than this. Come on. The power of the people is often feared by a repressive establishment. That is true because it threatens the stability of the status quo. According to the gospel, written with an eye towards converting citizens of the Roman Empire to the Christian way, it was the will of Jewish authorities that Jesus be crucified. But crucifixion was not a Jewish punishment. If the charges against Jesus had been blasphemy, as suggested in the gospel, Jesus would have been stoned by the Jewish community not crucified 
crucifixion was a Roman execution reserved specifically for seditionists. It seems to have been a public acclaim of Jesus as king that led to his execution as an enemy of Rome. But his execution didn't happen, so none of that matters. And the Roman Empire probably didn't exist. Welcome to the Great Awakening. Nothing you believe to be true is actually true. The Gospels record that Jesus was not only a political figure, the king of the Jews, but he was also a religious leader who called to the people to repent and prepare for the kingdom of God. He repeatedly challenged the religious leaders concerning their teachings and their interpretations of scriptures, and he was a healer. And the book entitled Jesus the Magician, Ancient Middle East Sources, are quoted in an attempt to show Jesus was one of the traveling wonder workers of the time. However, it seemed far more likely from the scriptural accounts that Jesus was genuinely charismatic healer who understood the psychic phenomenon of people being healed by as a dynamic of their own faith. In fact, Jesus often says exactly that your faith has made you whole. Kind of. Yeshua and Magdalene were teachers. They were teaching you about the Christ, which was within you. It's the Kundalini. It's your own liberation. They were basically teaching you the principles of yoga. Which we know that the religious leaders don't like because when you're liberated, you don't need them. You can't be controlled by them. And the church, who is run by the cabal, wants to control you. According to Luke's gospel, Jesus visited the synagogue at Nazareth and read aloud to the congregation from the prophecy of Isaiah. The spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glant tidings to the lowly, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive and release the prisoners. No, we know that's made up by King James because Yeshua teaching this would not have said that he was here to do that. He would have said he was here to teach you how to do that for yourself because only you can liberate yourself. It has been the consensus of Christians for nearly 2,000 years. The man who appropriated these verses to himself was no mere magician. He was the earthen vessel filled with the Spirit of God, and it was his powerful charisma that so inevitably led to his crucifixion as a political incendiary and to the desperate flight of his immediate family from Jerusalem. No. The greatest secret is that the bloodline of Magdalene was Atlantean. Not that they were hidden. They've been hidden all this time, but in the time of their life, they were not hidden. We're talking about the fall of Atlantis, which was the apocalypse, the tribulation, and then the a thousand years of peach, was peach, which was Tartaria. Then we had the mud floods. Now we're in Gog and Magog. That's the good news because we're at the end of the book. We're at the end. A thousand years of peace has already happened. The flowering staff in the sand grow. What does legend say about the refuge holy family? Scripture, of course, in the New Testament of gospel reports that a holy family fled to Egypt to avoid having its child murdered by King Herod, who was worried about his claim to the throne of Israel. Joseph, the husband of Mary, was told in a dream to take Mary and Jesus and flee into Egypt. The wildly held belief of many modern biblical scholars is that this is mythology used by the author of Matthew's gospel to fulfill the word of the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. The fossil of truth is in this story is the strong tradition of danger to the royal bloodline of Judah, to the royal bloodline of Atlantis. Correction, Margaret Starbird. An apocryphal gospel is the source of the tradition that St. Joseph's staff sprouted as a sign from God that he was chosen to be the husband of Mary and earthly father of her child. But the flowering staff which is shown in St. Shown in Joseph's hand in Catholic churches worldwide, also serves to remind us that Joseph was the custodian of the shoot, understood to be Jesus himself based on the prophecy of Isaiah. A shoot shall prout, prout, sprout from the stump of Jesse, and from his root shall bud shall blossom. So I'm imagining there's that kind of half true because Alma Mari, who was Yahshua's mother, was impregnated by her husband, Yosef not by a spirit of God. That's a demonic sex ritual to be raped by a demon and impregnated by a demon. They're having you worship a demonic sex ritual. Yeshua and Magdalene were conceived the miraculous way that we are all conceived by consent through loving people. 
But tradition derived from an old French legend from the Mediterranean coast tells us that another Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, was the custodian of the Sangreal, and that the child on the boat was Egyptian, which means quite literally born in Egypt. It seems likely that after the crucifixion of Jesus, Magdalene found it necessary to flee for the sake of her unborn child to the nearest refuge. Well, Yeshua was born in Egypt, Margaret Starbert. He wasn't born in Bethlehem. He was born in Egypt, girl, girl. He was born in Egypt. If you really believe the Bible stories, I got I got a bridge I want to sell you. If our theory is correct, the child actually, actually was born in Egypt. Egypt was a traditional place of asylum for the Jews whose safety was threatened in Israel. Alexandria was easily reached from Judah and contained well-established Jewish communities at the time of Jesus. In all probability, the emergent refuge of Magdalene and Joseph of Marathia was Egypt. And later, years later, they left Alexandria and sought an even safer haven off the coast of France. Alexandria, in my opinion, is New Orleans. Scholars of archaeology and linguistics have found that place names and legends of an area contain fossils from that area's remote past. The truth may be embellished by changes and stories may suffer abridgment through the years of telling, but traces of the truth remain in fossil form buried in the names of people and places in the towns of Les Saint Marie de la Mar in France. There is a festival every May 23rd to 25th at the shrine in honor of St. Sarah the Egyptian, also called Sarah Kali, the Black Queen. Closed security reveals that this festival, which originated in the Middle Ages, is in honor of an Egyptian child who accompanied Magdalene, Martha, and Lazarus, arriving with them in a small boat that came ashore at the location approximately AD 42. The people seem to have assumed that the child being Egyptian was a dark-skinned and by further interpretation she must have been the servant of the family from bethany since no other reasonable explanation could be found for her presence i got something to say about these fossils of truth tartaria if you look through tartarian files margaret starbert you can see the controllers literally moving archaeological evidence I hate to break it to you, honey. They weren't in France that we know it. They were in Gaul, which was Canada. And they were there as a family with Yeshua. Because he wasn't crucified. And if that's a problem for you, if you're triggered by him being not being crucified, when I found out he wasn't crucified, I was like, fuck yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Liberation, like the good God doesn't do that. If you're triggered by him not being crucified, then maybe you are a Satanist. Maybe you prefer the bloodlust of human sacrifice. So I would have a, I would go inside and have a little chit chat with myself if I really was upset that this person wasn't crucified. If, if you're excited he wasn't crucified, then congratulations, you're on the path of serving the right God. So just something you need to, to go within yourself and really think about. All right. The name Sarah means queen or princess in Hebrew. The Sarah is further characterized in local legends as young, no more than a child. So we have in a tiny coastal town in France, a yearly festival in, young, in honor of a young dark skinned girl called Sarah. The fossil in this legend is that the child is called princess in Hebrew. A child of Jesus born after Mary's flight to Alexandria would have been about 12 years of age at the time of the voyage to Gaul recorded in the legend. She, like the princess of David's line, is symbolically black, unrecognized in the streets. The Magdalene herself, the Saint Graal, in the sense that she was the chalice or the vessel that once carried the royal blood bloodline in utero. Oh, that makes me so mad. That makes me so mad. A woman, honey, Margaret, us women, we're not, we're not just cattle, honey. We're not, that's not, you are echoing all these men of the church that were actually Satanists. Go back and look at what men of the church have said about women. You are echoing their sentiments that all women are good for is to carry a bloodline of their husbands. If you believe that to be truth, then Margaret, you and I don't worship the same God, honey. Magdalene was the bloodline. That's why her descendants were called the Merovingians, not the Yashavingians. It was her bloodline. Her Atlantean bloodline. 
the symbolic blackness of the bride and conicals and divonic prince of lemonations is extended to this hidden Mary and her child. It appears the festival of the black princess Sarah Kali in honor of their same symbolic black child. In a later chapter, we will be investigate more closely the shrines of the Black Madonna in Western Europe. Oh, goody. Oh, goody. More propaganda to dig through. Yay. It is likely that those in later centuries who knew this legend, the identity of Magdalene as the wife of Jesus, Yahshua, equated her with the Black Bride from Conicles. She was the sister bride and the beloved. But, yeah, but Magdalene wasn't Black. Magdalene wasn't Black. Yahshua was. But Magdalene looked like me. She was blonde, reddish hair, blue eyes. Egyptians were all races. Look at the hieroglyphics from Egypt. They were all races because they were the leftover Atlanteans. Your race identifies your galactic origins. Magdalene was not black. Her husband was, but she was not. She was Kentuckian. Her galactic origin came through Kenteca, the planet Kenteca, which is where we get the Druid and the Celtic culture from. So she looked like, she probably looked like someone that could be dancing in river dance. And that's why the Druids and the Celtics are heavily associated with Magdalene because they were Kentuckian. This information is out there. You just have to look. Her blackness would have been symbolic of her hidden state. No, that was the unknown queen, unacknowledged, reputed, and vilified by the church through centuries in an attempt to deny the legitimate bloodline and to maintain its own doctrine of the divinity and celibacy of Jesus. Her blackness is also direct reference to the deposed devonic princes of Jerusalem. Brighter than snow were her princes, whiter than milk. Now their appearance is blacker than sought. They are unrecognizable on the streets. Fossils of truth remain buried in our symbols, our proper names of purses and places, our ritual and folktales. This understood, it is plausible that the flight into Egypt was taken by the other Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, and the other Mary, Mary Magdalene, to protect the unborn child of Jesus from the Romans and the sons of Herod after crucifixion. This discrepancies in the story and the obvious generation gap can easily be understood in light of the danger to this bloodline, which required the utmost secrecy as their whereabouts and in light of the time that elapsed before the story was committed to writing. This seems to be another case of a myth being formed because the truth was too dangerous to be told. But Margaret, everybody knew they were married and they had five children. They didn't have just one child. They had five. They were busy. They read the Magdalene manuscript. They get very much into detail about their sex life. All right. They were busy. They had five children. Five. Not one. Five. Three girls, two boys. They were busy. Okay. The Merovingian connection. Now she's going to talk about the Merovingians. There is evidence to suggest that the royal bloodline of Jesus and Mary Magdalene eventually flowed into the veins of the Merovingian monarchs of France. The name Merovingian may itself be a linguistic fossil. The lore surrounding the royal family of the Franks mentions their ancestor Merovi, but the word Merovingian breaks down phonetically into symbols that we can really or easily recognize. Mary and vine, Mary and the vine, no, Magdalene and the vine. Broken down this way, it may be seen to allude to the vine of Mary or perhaps the vine of the mother. No, it, it Mark, go watch my video on the Merovingians. I did all the research, girl. You can just watch that video if you want to because it seems you don't really know how to research, I'm assuming. It's the Magdalene bloodline. That's what it means, the Magdalene bloodline, because it's the Atlantean bloodline. It's not really, Magdalene was just the carrier of the bloodline of Atlantis into our world, into Tartaria, which then led us to where we are now, into Gog and Magog. And that is what the controllers don't want you to know. They want you to think that the 10 missing tribes of Israel have to do with actual literal tribes on this planet. No, honey, that's your 10 DNA strands that aren't active because you are the galactic descendant of atlantis that's the big secret that's it 
The royal embalm of the Merovingian king, king Clovis was the fleur, fleur de lis, the iris. The Latin name for the iris flower, which grows wild in the countries of the Middle East, is gladius or small world. This also grows wild in the Southeast, where they actually lived, Margaret Starbird. Remember, as the guy on YouTube says, I love this quote, the Egypt in Africa is just the entertainment. That's just like the amusement park. Like, it's not real. That's not really Egypt. If we still think that's Egypt, then the controllers are really laughing at us. That the Egypt is the southeast of the United States. Memphis, that's the real Memphis on the Mississippi River, which is the Nile. Girl. The Egypt of Africa is like Disney World. It's just the amusement park. It's not really where things happened. The fleur de lis is of the royal house of France is a masculine symbol. In fact, it is a graphic image of the covenant of circumcision in which are inherited all the promises of God to Israel and the house of David. No, honey, no. Go watch my video on the Merovingians. I'll see if I can put it in the description box below. Honey, no, no, girl, no. Again, I got a bridge in London I want to sell you if you believe this shit. Thomas Inman discusses the masculine nature of the flower of light at the length in his 19th century work, Ancient Pagan and Modern Christian Symbols. It is almost amusing that the same male symbol, the little sword, is today the international em embelm of the Boy Scouts. Well, there you go, Margaret. There you go. That is why this is fucking propaganda. The Boy Scouts are part of the problem, too. So they tied it all together in a nice little package so that you always venerate the controllers, so that you always worship the controllers and not know the truth. You are just pushing and peddling their shit in this book. The assertion that this symbol represents the Trinity is a rationalized base on the three-in-one image. The three-pronged lily is the ancient symbol for Israel. The, no. But no, the capitals of the two phallic pillars of Solomon's temple. <sighs> the framed shamrock of St. Patrick may be a legitimate symbol for the Trinity, but I believe the Fleur de Lis refers specifically to the Devonic bloodline of Israel and was used at their emblem by the royal Merovingians in Europe. The grave of the Merovingian king who died circa 481, was discovered in 1653 in Tournay and was found to contain 300 golden bees. The bee was known to have been a familiar totem of the Merovingian kings. Yes, because bees were the sacred symbols of the goddess of love and were also Egyptian symbols for royalty, which was here in the southeast. All of this is found in the southeast. I think it likely that the totem of the golden bee was consciously chosen to reflect the descendants of the Merovingian line from the royal house of David through the female line and that they honored the royal widow Magdalene and her daughter, whom legend called Sarah. The royal bloodline of Israel may have survived persecution and eventually surfaced in the Merovingians of Europe and in related families that guarded their secret genealogists through the centuries. The first crusade could then conceivably have been an attempt to restore an heir to the divinic bloodline to the throne of Jerusalem and the purse and person of Godfrey of Boulogne, who was also known as Godfrey of Lorraine, who was according to legend of Merovingian lineage. But we don't know if the Crusades actually happened, guys. Like, we don't know if that actually happened. With the conquest of Jerusalem in 1099, the leaders of the crusade installed a patriarch in the Church of the Holy Specter in Jerusalem. And in their liturgical formula, we find it the bizarre fact that all the feasts of the Virgin Mary were to be marked by black vestments. It is suggested that this use had reference to the Song of Songs, but it was marked departure from the universal custom of the church in which white vestments were worn for all ligatures on Mag uh, Marian feast day. But Jerusalem is not where any... All of the shit happened here in America, you guys. Like, that's another big secret. Why do you think America has been so important to the world? Not just for us Americans. And I'm not saying this to be arrogant at all. This is just this is just fact. This is the Holy Land. So I don't know what was going on with the Crusades. If the Crusades even happened at all. Or if they were just made up history to get us brainwashed into thinking that that was the holy land and not this right why do you think the controllers did such a smear campaign on americans making other people in other countries 
stupid Americans, hate Americans, is because they want you to hate the Holy Land. It's got really nothing to do with us. It's just the land. This is the land that was used. That was the Holy Land where all this happened. Anyway. Okay. Where was I? All right. I think it likely that the totem of the golden bee was consciously chosen to reflect the descendants of the Merovingian line from the royal house of David, hence Jesus, through the female line that they honored the royal widow Magdalene and her daughter, whom legend called Sarah. But it was the Magdalene line, and she had five children. The royal bloodline of Israel may have survived persecution and eventually surfaced in the Merovingians of Europe and in related families that guarded their secret genealogies through the centuries they weren't the bloodlines of, the royal bloodlines are israel of israel are in the royal families but that's because it's the controller's bloodline not the actual like real legit bloodlines like that was to the merovingians which was the dark ages which is what they don't want us to like know about because that was like tartaria right so like once you see it you can't unsee it these associations of the Black Bride may be the reason for the immense popularity of the numerous shrines to the Black Madonna scattered throughout Western Europe. The image of the Sister Bride from the ancient world was easily associated with the wife of Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. Classical replicas of the Earth, Moon, and the Love Goddess, Isis, Armitis, and were characteristically black. In summary, the two royal refuge from Israel, mother and daughter, might logically be represented in early European art as the dark-skinned mothered and child, the hidden ones. The black Madonnas of the early shrines in Europe, 5th to 12th centuries, might have been the venerated as symbolic of the other Mary and her child, the Saint Graal, which Joseph of Arimathea brought in safety to the coast of France. The symbol for the male of the royal house of David would be a flowering or budding staff, but the symbol for a woman would have been a chalice, a cup or a vessel containing the royal blood of Jesus. And that is exactly what the Holy Ground Grail has said to have been. Yeah, it's, I mean, a woman's wound is a, ch is a chalice, but it wasn't to carry his blood. Yeah, it carried a sperm, but it was her blood. Listen, 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 Linda, listen, Linda. I love that YouTube. Listen, Linda. Let's think about this logically as a woman. I am O negative. If I get pregnant with a child whose father is RH positive, my body could reject the fetus. The mother's body holds dominance over whether that child lives or not. So it's not like Yeshua could just insert his sperm and then that's it. Mary's just going to give birth to his children. No, it had to align with her blood type, which she had the same blood type as me, O negative. What does that tell you about the importance of the woman's chalice? They say by the time you are 30 years old, most women have had about 10 miscarriages that they are unaware of. That shows you how the chalice will get rid of bloodlines that it can't support the life of. It can't support that life. So there has to be importance with the woman's bloodline. Because the woman's bloodline is really all that matters in that pregnancy. So whose bloodline are they protecting really? Magdalene's.